from the start It was sweet and you got caught Oh, we were wild Riding every high and low Never meant to take it slow The wrong way was the right road Oh, we were wild You can leave me with battle scars But you're never gonna break my Hello, my friend. Glad to see you made it. Glory be to God. Jesus Christ is alive. Uh, we're outside today. I hope the wind isn't too much of a problem. Uh, it's a beautiful day. I, I think it feels good to be out outside in the world. Uh, it was a very nice, quiet morning, and so I hope we don't have too much vehicle traffic or, or windy traffic or, or any of that stuff. <coughs> Today I want to talk about Jonah <coughs> and how Jonah had an encounter with God, right? That's kind of like everybody's life. They motoring along in life without a care to the world and everything's going just fine. Same way with Job. You don't have a care in the world and everything's going great in life. Right, look at Joseph. Everything's going well for him, and then when he meets God, everything changes. How about Isaiah? Isaiah has an encounter with God. And everything changes. Job loses everything. Loses his family, loses his loved ones, he loses his cattle and his herd of animals that he was using to make a living on. Lost it all, lost everything. House burns down, his farm burns down. Joseph basically loses everything thrown in a well, stripped of his coat of many colors, thrown into slavery, and then into prison. Jonah meets God. And God says to Jonah, go to the Ninevites. They have done evil. So much evil it has risen to the heights of heaven. And now I'm irritated, now I'm upset, right? And First thing Jonah does is goes the opposite way. The opposite way. I think it was kind of interesting when John the Baptist was arrested by Herod. Jesus went the other way. Instead of going down to John the Baptist and freeing him from prison, he goes the opposite way and heads to the northern section of Israel while John was in prison down in the southern half of Israel. 
I don't know. Besides, he's gonna run from God, the will of God. It's God's will that he used Jonah as a messenger. Yeah, we see in the message of Jonah, they're, they're, it's about the messenger. It's not about the message. All we know is they, they were doing evil in the eyes of God, and God wanted them to turn from that evil. And other than that, we, we, the story is about Jonah and his refusal to do what God wanted him to do. Like Jonah would try and, and do anything in life except for what God wanted. I, I, I felt that way. I remember 1994, I was called by Jesus. Had an experience, an encounter with an angel of the Lord, had a, a vision, was given a bunch of instructions. And then 20 years later, I began to follow those instructions, began to put those instructions into action. And the reason was uh, I was tired of running from God. Run from God, and that is the trial. It's not that God tests us or puts us in trials and tribulation. When we turn and, and try and run from whatever God's will is in, in our lives, there's where the trials begin. There's where the testing is. Jonah boards a ship down in Tarshish, and, and he's going to head out and go somewhere opposite, right? Nineveh. That time was the capital city of Syria, the Syrians. And for many years, throughout all the Bible, we hear of the brutal attacks of the Assyrians on the Israel nation. They were their enemies. Jonah saying to God, I'm a Hebrew. Why would I go and tell them to repent? <laughs> You know, one of the things we, we, in life, we desire the most is to see the destruction of our enemies, right? They, they, they walk about doing everything they can to destroy us, our family, the things we love. And yet we're going to go and provide for them a, a way of salvation. We're going to provide for them goodness, mercy, things they never showed anybody. You know, people come and work in, in the works of evil, but not us, right? Not the children of God. Even though we are subject to it, we, we don't turn to it. It's sometimes the greatest evil in life is turning away from God, turning away from our calling. Well, whatever it may be, I'm sure if you were a doctor, there was nothing in life going to stop you from becoming a doctor. Right? And any time you turned or, or tried something else, maybe psychiatry or whatever it may be, and a nurse, no, that's, that's not right, that's not going to justify maybe you tried to be a businessman and again everything fails but every step you took towards becoming a doctor there was no failure in that and everything needed was supplied for that easy straight path when you're on the will of God you're acting inside the will of God God creates a giant storm as Jonah is on the boat now out in the middle of the ocean and everybody on the boat becomes terrified as they all begin praying and asking for mercy from their gods. And these people were not worshipers of the Lord or, or the God of Israel. They had their own gods and they're begging for mercy, begging for their lives. They go down into the bottom of the boat and are beginning to throw out all the excess weight so that the waves don't crash the boat and, and then drown them all. 
kind of like I remember Paul is in three shipwrecks three shipwrecks and none of those things could prevent or, or stop Paul from accomplishing his will and, and it wasn't his will right it was the will of God working through Paul which transformed Paul and turned him into the guy he was and nothing was going to prevent Paul from completing God's mission, which was to go into Rome, preaching to the Gentiles, preaching to Israel's enemy, a way of salvation, a, a, a way of life. And they were vile, nasty, and evil people yet. Yeah. Paul didn't go into Rome to spread more evil or hatred or malice for his enemies. Rather, he went to share with them a way of salvation, a new way of life, new way of thinking. He was ultimately destroyed, beheaded. Paul was stoned to death almost to the inches of his life. Many times was thrown in prison. Nobody accepted Paul's message. It was a, a bitter message to them. Very bitter. I'm sure Jonah probably feared the worst, right? Feared the same. Why, why would I go into Nineveh when they are our enemies? Then what, gonna go speak against them? Speak against their way of life? Their roles and what they're doing? And they're gonna destroy me. What good will it do? Right? And Jonah believing that God is merciful. He ain't gonna go destroy those people. God doesn't destroy anyone. God is so merciful. He allows the wicked to live. And not only be wicked, but practice in evil things. God gives life to all the bad and the good. Why would God destroy them when I know he's merciful? Let God do his work while I go and enjoy my life. That's a lot of us in life. You know, I, I feel all those things. I try to go get a, a job. I fill out applications all the time. And I don't get the jobs. I don't get the jobs, and I don't know why. I guess if I had a better haircut, United States of America, uh, maybe I'd get the job, right? Maybe I'd get the job if, if I looked like the owner of the businesses that I was applying for, I, I, I don't know. But everything I do towards the preaching and teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, bringing God's word to you, psh, there's absolutely nothing to hinder me in that. Nothing hinders me from that. I have everything I need to do that, you know. I want to go on a great mission to the Philippines, but I have absolutely no way to do it. No means to do it. Vast people who claim to be a part of the body of Christ, filled with God's Holy Spirit. And if it's the same Spirit that rose Jesus back to life, that unveiled, it, unveiled himself to Paul, unveiled himself to you, and then unveiled himself to me, and yet we're all in an argument. On who's right, or who knows, and what's God's will? How can, how can it be God? Like, does, does he create confusion? Is he the author of confusion? Or is God real focused on, on some goal or plan or, or will or purpose? Because I think that's the thing with God, very focused. Sometimes I get pretty focused on things that I want to do. Like, I don't know. 
It's everything David wants to do, nothing plans out. And the desires of David are, are exactly that, the, the desires of David. And but I'm not sure there's even anybody out there who shares in those desires I share, or I have. Then I wonder if I'm fighting God, trying to accomplish something that may not be in His will. James says, don't plan your future or say, tomorrow I'm going to go do this, or I'm going to do that, or I'm going to gather together a bunch of people and we're going to go do something great. I'm going to go to this town, live, do business there. And, and yet, any plan or anything decided for our lives is, is planned out by God, done by God. We, we have no say in tomorrow, or what we do, or what we're going to become. I think like in, in the story of Jonah and Job, and Joseph and Isaiah, who was strung to a tree and then sawn in half, cut him right in half from straight down through those crops. Probably used a doll deer antler too. But you don't know what you got until it's taken away. And everything you got will be taken away because you can't take none of this with you anywhere. You can't take it with you into the kingdom of heaven. But you don't know what you got until it's taken away, like Job. didn't receive a, a double portion or a double blessing until later. After he met God, after everything was taken away, maybe it was because he didn't recognize or realize he who was blessed. The devil said to God, yeah, he's blessed, all right, because you put a hedge of protection around him. But we find out in the story that the blessing comes by faith, not by sight. And once we realize we we're blessed, been blessed all along, why are we blessed? Because we have the presence of God in our lives. Evidence God is in our lives is the hatred of the world, your inability to be fed, your inability to provide for yourself, or people you love, homes, shelter I don't know me I could live without it all I guess I don't provide for any of it because this world won't allow it you know go to school and learn from a high school teacher high school teachers are, are worth their money, they're worth their value. Even elementary school teachers have great value and you reward their efforts, their work. But the prophets of God, <laughs> yeah. they're thrown out of the kingdom. Their work is on the outside. The outside where, where there's weeping and gnashing of the teeth. People go to the bottom of the well, or, or the boat, and they see Jonah's down there, sleeping. He's asleep. I remember the disciples hanging out with Jesus out, gonna cross the Sea of Galilee, and a great storm comes up, and the boat's about to be tossed into the sea, and capsized, and all its occupants drowned. And Jesus is sleeping in the midst of it, just sleeping. And the disciples say, Lord, wake up. Can you not see the storm around us? Like, how can you sleep through a hurricane? In a boat made of wood 2,000 years ago. <laughs>
Jonah says, oh, God is angry with me. Hey, what did you do, Jonah? Tried to run from God. Trying to run from God, engaging in our own sin, has an effect on all the people around us. You know? For me, sin is not believing God. Jonah didn't believe God. No, nope. not going to use me today, Lord. <laughs> he didn't believe God and God. Yes, I will. Surely I, I will use you. Yeah. Uh, Ask him, you know, what do you do? Fighting God. Angry with God. Running from God. Who's your God? The God of heaven and earth? The God of the winds and the waves? The God of nature? And then they become terrified. Jonah says, the answer is throw me overboard. Same like Jesus, you know, in, in his life. Great fire. I mean, he created such an uproar in, in Jerusalem that they ended up crucifying him. I mean, he was about to change the world. In, in fact, the high priest Caiaphas said, if we don't kill this man, everybody is going to believe in him. Everyone is going to turn to this guy. And he said, it's greater to sacrifice one man and save the whole city than to have everyone lost to that man. <laughs> Jesus says, the reason it's all messed up is because of me. The reason there's such great turmoil is because of me. The reason there are seven plagues being rained out from the heavens is because of him. All the problems are because of him. Jonah says, throw me overboard and I will drown. I will die. And I will receive my due punishment. You guys live. Hey, you, you got everything. Got the world by the balls. You got jobs, you got income, you got everything you need. To do whatever God has enabled you to do. But for me, all the problems of the world will cease to exist. Just throw me overboard. They take his advice and throw him overboard, and immediately a giant whale eats Jonah, drags Jonah to the bottom of the ocean. For three days, Jesus says to everyone, the only sign you're going to receive is the sign of Jonah. And finally, Jonah cries out to God for help. And the whale barfs Jonah up on the third day onto dry land. Same with the world. The world barfed up Jesus on the third day and delivered him to dry land. Dry land being a secure place. Delivered him to heaven. Presence of God. And after that, Jonah is now ready to do the will of God. Once everything's taken away, now you're, you're ready to do the will of God. It's not about your will, but your strength, your power, your, your message, your, your whatever it is. It's not about your gift. It's about doing the will of God. Goes into Nineveh 40 days. And God's going to destroy this city. 
And then he came out the next day. 39 days. And God is going to destroy this city. Came back out. 38 days and God will destroy this city. 10 days and God's going to destroy this city. In five days, God is going to destroy this city. Now people begin to listen. What do you mean, going to destroy this city? Turn from their wicked ways. Turn from your evilness. Greed, murder, sexual immorality. Turn back to God. Turn away from oppressing the poor. Trying to muzzle the ox while treading seed. Turn away from harassing and oppressing Israel. Four more days and God's going to destroy you. Finally, word reaches to the king. And the king hears it. And he orders a decree that everybody in the nation put on sackcloth cover themselves in ashes. They even put sackcloth and ashes upon all of their animals. Declared a time of fasting. A fasting. We see in Isaiah 58 what a true fast is. Releasing and loosening the bonds of those who are in slavery, who are being oppressed who are being rejected and denied, who are being gossiped over and slandered about, loosening their bonds. And, uh, then Jonah decides, well, I'm gonna go up on a hill, right? We see the two witnesses are dressed in sackcloth and ashes in, in the book of Revelation. Ashes and sackcloths represent complete repentance, complete surrender. Uh, you may notice I, I have where I wear overalls, which comes with its own little breastplate of cloth. And uh, I'm soaked in ashes. My clothes. Are they look dirty if you see them from a distance. I wash them every now and then, but my clothes are soaked in ashes. And uh, yeah, I wear sackcloth clothes that are uncomfortable. Make people feel uncomfortable when you're around you. Make me feel uncomfortable when everybody around you looks at you and is like, who's this guy? I ain't no preacher. That's just some dude in his backyard. <laughs> yeah. You know, Jonah's sitting on that hill watching out over Nineveh, waiting for God to destroy them. Pretty soon, nothing happens. Nothing happens. You know? God says to Jonah, why are you so upset? You look angry. Right? Of course, Jonah, for 40 days, prophesying that God was going to destroy the city, and then, you know, after 40 days passed by, nothing happened. <laughs> Same way people preach and say, Jesus is coming, and, and 2,000 years later, nothing's happened. <laughs> so God sends out a scorching heat from the sun. Jonah's sweating to death, and, and he's just out in the middle of the wilderness on the top of a mountain. 
waiting for the destruction of his enemies. And this heat, the, the sun is burning down on him. And then all of a sudden he's whining, he's crying. Oh Lord, just kill me and get it over with. End my life, end this suffering. And the next day, God grows a, a gourd bush, a nice bush grows over and creates all this shade for Jonah. And Jonah's really comfortable in the shade. And he's happy, still sitting there waiting for his enemies to be destroyed. But he's comforted inside that shade, inside the shadow of God's wings inside the shadow of God's protection, right? We're all blessed like Job when we got, you know, seven kids and 700 animals to his livestock and we have a well-functioning farm and not only do we have so much excess or so much abundance, we're able to help people, helping the widows and, and helping the poor and, and the orphans and we're doing all kinds of good things. And, and when that's taken away, nothing left. You ain't doing nothing good. There's nothing good you can do. Anytime you think of doing something good, you, you're always stopped. Don't have no money. And then Jonah. God sends a worm. To, to bite that tree. It's amazing the worm, without complaining, obeyed God perfectly. And he bites the tree. His shade, his protection and his comfort. And then when that's taken away, again Jonah's crying out, seeking help from God or whoever. God says to Jonah, boy, you, you sure loved the shade when it was provided for you. Yet you hated it when I took the shade away. You're very upset and grumpy. Why should I destroy those people? They repented. They changed. They dressed themselves in sackcloth and ashes. They did what was right in my eyes. Surely if a person who is sinning turns from their sin to the Lord, the Lord will reward them with righteousness. But if a righteous, good person turns away from the Lord to do bad or wicked, that's credited to them as wickedness, evil. You know. Each one of us is held accountable for our very own actions, and really the only one affected by our actions is the, me, or you, or whoever it is living by them actions. God says to Jonah, I'm not going to destroy them. I'm not going to destroy those animals either. They, they did nothing wrong to me. So I guess that's the things we always got to come to terms with when we're dealing with God. It's, the only one who can change is, is yourself. And the only one going to benefit from the change is yourself. And I've seen evidence of this a thousand times over. Once the change happens for yourself and you go from rags to riches, you're very happy. You're very blessed and you're very Generous to tell everybody how blessed and happy you are, but 
when it goes from riches to rags, all of a sudden, we're, we're cursed, no longer blessed, no longer happy to tell people about how blessed we are. Shamed. Yet you never know how blessed you truly are until it's taken away, until you got it, and then it's removed. It's like for Job. It's like for Jonah. Just like for the children of Israel who removed Joseph from their family. And yet, until they were, were reu reunited with Joseph, they struggled. And they had lots of heartache. And Joseph struggled. Had lots of heartache. Just because you've lost everything doesn't mean you're unvalued or, or worthless in the eyes of God. And just because the world won't change or, or accept you for who you are doesn't mean you're not valued or, or loved by God. So I think that's the thing we see in Jesus the most is no matter what happens in life, you, you cannot escape the will of God. And it is the will of God that you would repent and come to completion in your faith with Jesus Christ, in your faith with Jesus Christ. You know, Jonah said, I knew all along, Lord, you are never going to destroy them because of all the gods that are gods, you are merciful. Merciful. All right, guys, in our next video or next study, we're going to be going through Leviticus chapter 17, 18, and 19. Please take a look at that. None of those laws have been erased or taken away from our lives. And I think it's important that we know what those laws are. See you next time.